So, remember that the main object of study here are uh, splice diagrams, and I gave as example of a non-star shaped one the following one. This is a splice diagram. I said that from this diagram one can build uh, a so-called splice type system. And uh, then the rule was to look at the nodes. Here each node is of valency 3. That's why one will associate one equation to each node. And for this one has first to associate variables to the leaves. And now the equations will involve those variables and uh, the problem is to find the monomials appearing in them. So let's go to this vertex here. There will be three monomials corresponding to the three edges going out from it. The monomial corresponding to each edge involves only the variables which are seen in that direction. That's why here we have a monomial only in Z1. Here we will have a monomial in Z2. And here a monomial in Z3, Z4. And now the problem is to put exponents. When we go directly to leaves, the exponents are easy. They are the edge weights. So here two and three. And when we go here, here we have to solve a Diophantine equation of degree one, which uh, is the question, does seven belong to some semi-group, numerical semi-group? And the game is you go from the node towards all the leaves, and each time you go to a leaf, you look in your walk, you see the nearby flowers, and you look at the number which decorates the flower and you make the product of those numbers. So here when we go towards Z3, we see only one flower here, the number is two. So we ask for the Diophantine equation, seven, it's something times two. And this is a question we ask about the variable Z3 here, plus something times the variable times five, when we go towards Z4. And uh, here there is a unique solution. 1, 1, and that's why here we have 1 and 1. And now here one has to adjust for non-zero coefficients. Any non-zero coefficients can be uh, chosen, and one has also higher order terms. And uh, doing the same on this other side, one has uh, Z1 here, in this direction, a monomial in Z1, Z2. Then, in this direction, a monomial in Z3. Here, a monomial in Z4. Here, the power is 5. There, the power is 2. In this direction, the Diophantine equation will be 11. Is something times, when we go towards Z1, 3 plus something times, when you go to Z2, times 2. And the solution could be 3 times 3 plus 1 times 2, which means that one can put here the exponent uh, 3 and 1. And again, one has coefficients. And therefore, the splice type system here is a system consisting of these two equations. Again, here one has higher order terms. This equals zero. 
and this equals zero. So the splice type system consists of these two equations. So you see that you have a system of equations, the splice type system, defines uh, a germ, say x of gamma, if gamma is the splice diagram, here inside C4. And in general, we get uh, n minus 2 equations defining a germ inside Cn. And the basic theorem of uh, Neumann and Wall is that imposing Hams non-vanishing condition on minors Remember that if here the degree is bigger, we have to write several times this equation by varying the coefficients. One gets their matrix of coefficients and the non-vanishing is a non-vanishing of the maximal minors of uh, that matrix. And this for every node. Here in this example, the non-vanishing is simply that of the coefficient. Under such non-vanishing conditions, one gets an uh, isolated complete intersection surface singularity ICIS isolated complete intersection singularity so you see the system is of the form F1 equals 0 Fn minus 2 equals 0, so behind it one has a morphism from c to the power n. Here the n is a number of variables, here n is equal to 4 in this example. So this is a number of leaves of gamma, and this is a basic exercise of graph theory that if you add on over the internal nodes, the valency minus 2, here we have one equation which is 3 minus 2, you make this sum, then you get the number of leaves minus 2. Patrick? Okay. Yes? Um, I have a question regarding the different choices that you can uh, take for the solution of the Diophantine equation, because you said the uh, 11, there's two ways to, to write 11 as a combination of 3 and 2. And you said that in this way you get equivalent singularities. So, yes. and forgetting the equations, the classes you get by allowing the variation of coefficients and the variation of higher order terms are the same. They yeah. are independent of this. So and this was also proved by Neumann and Wall. Okay, but uh, my question is that I, I, I don't know how hard it is to, if I give you two singularities, to say if they are equivalent or not. So can this be a tool to prove that singularities are equivalent because it's... Uh... So if you go inside their, their proof, you find some ingredients which can be used for other systems of equation. But I think that the general problem of deciding if you have two concrete systems if they describe isomorphic singularities, is very tough. I'm not conscious of a general algorithm or something like this. Okay, so this can be seen as a also a partial answer somehow. This is part of the specificities of this class, that such uh -huh. questions can be, uh, can be answered. Okay, thanks. It has many special properties, and we still explore what's special about this class. So you see that here, you have a germ defined by f1 to fn minus 2 to cn minus 2 
Yes, there was another question. No? So here, our singularity is a fiber above the origin, as S for one function, generic nearby fibers define Milner fibers. And this is because one has a complete intersection. Because if one had more equations here, then the generic nearby fiber would be of smaller dimension. But each time you have a complete intersection, you get for free Milner fibers. So, one gets Milner fibers. Fiber as simply this map, which I call F underline here. F underline minus one of some epsilon, and epsilon belongs to a ball here of some small radius inside Cn minus 2 and is taken generic. So generic here means precisely outside a discriminant of the situation. Okay, so that's why such singularities have Milner fibers. And uh, their conjecture is about a way to describe this Milner fiber, which is a four-dimensional manifold with boundary, by a four-dimensional splicing operation from the Milner fibers of these two sides. Uh, Patrick, th these are always quasi-homogeneous? No. No. It's so only when they are uh, star-shaped and when you remove the higher-order terms. Okay. Uh, so you wrote CN because you just didn't want to take uh, for notational reasons, or do you really take the whole CN for the Milner fiber? Do you take it really No, it's globally? exactly like in the usual story. You have to choose balls, blah, okay, blah, blah. Okay, so it just... Uh, okay. But this everybody knows now, okay, so okay. I don't the, uh, need to uh, So you're doing the usual thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. So why did they ask this question? Because... Uh, In 1990, Neumann and Wall uh, conjectured the following, that each time you have x, a normal surface singularity, which has two conditions, which is, first, isolated complete intersection singularity, and second, its boundary, it means its link, is an integral homology sphere. When you have this, then the Milner fiber if you think it's a feeling of the link, of the singularity. So it's a special four-dimensional manifold which has as boundary the link. And you have an infinite number of such manifolds up to diffeomorphism. Which one is picked by singularity theory is a basic question. And they conjectured that then there is at least a special numerical relation. Is that the Cassan invariant of the link, which is a topological invariant of the link, is one-eighth of the signature of the intersection form on the second homology of the Milner fiber, which I will write simply as the signature of the Milner fiber. How did they conjecture this? Cassan invariant was recent at that time. Cassan introduced it around 1985. And uh, Fintuchel and Stern had computed so well, each time a new invariant appears. Uh, happily, there are many people who try to compute it. And with modern invariants, it's in general very difficult to compute. And uh, Fintuchel and Stern made the first computations 
computed it. for the boundaries of uh, Brieshorn type singularities with generalized EA. So of Z of XP plus YQ plus ZR with P and Q pairwise co-prime, PQR pairwise co-prime, and we saw that this tells that the boundary is an integral homology sphere. So Kessen's invariant is defined as a count of uh, non-trivial representations of the fundamental group of the integral homology sphere in SU2, but as all modern counts, they are not cardinals. There's a subtle count related to some intersections in some moduli spaces, and that's why that was subtle. And in fact, their computations showed that in fact, in this situation, it is a cardinal. So it is the expected number, and that expected number turns out to be the signature of the Milner fiber. So given that, Neumann and Wall asked themselves how general was this phenomenon, and they could prove it, extend this, Neumann and Wall, extended this to manifolds to the singularities defined by the complete intersections I showed you. So it means to the splice type quasi-homogeneous singularities which correspond to the general splice diagrams which are star-shaped. Again with a co-prime condition. And another class, zero loci of what are called suspension singularities of this kind, where F defines an irreducible plane curve singularities, and there is a condition between N and the invariance here, which ensures that the link is an integral homology sphere. Namely, the condition is that N be co-prime to all numbers appearing in the characteristic pairs of the singularity. So these were the starting examples from their initial paper, and they asked themselves how general is a phenomenon. That's why the conjecture. And uh, one of their dreams there was to be able to construct the Milner fiber uh, from the link. Say, you look on the three manifold, consider some fields there, look at some moduli space, and you will be able to construct the Milner fiber. I don't know if there was some progress in that direction. And I won't speak about that direction here because I know nothing about it. But I tell it to you because I think that would be also a very exciting development to be able for special classes of singularities to construct the Milner fiber from the boundary by pure internal operations on the boundary. So. Here's the main, one of the main problems for attacking the conjecture, the Cassan invariant conjecture, which is here, was the lack of examples. I showed you here the examples, and one would like to work on more to see what happened. And this class of splice type singularities are invented, pressed by that desire. Okay, so they played a lot with the equations, at some moment they understood it. Okay, and now came the natural question, because again we have complete intersections with integral homology sphere links, is this conjecture true or not? And in a 2005 paper, Neumann and Wall, I simply abbreviate N and W, gave a uh, strategy of proof of the Cassan invariant conjecture for splice type singularities which was recursive in the splice diagram. I showed you that the splice diagram can be seen as a way to construct recursively an integral homology sphere starting from 
such links here by the splicing procedure. And they said, assume that one can do the same with a Milner fiber. And they conjectured this strategy was based on what was called the Milner, what they called the Milner fiber conjecture, which is the Milner fiber of such a splice diagram. I represent it symbolically like this, but now I put dots here, meaning that we concentrate on an internal edge of a splice diagram. So it's important not to think always of two simple objects. Here you could have in mind something like this. Okay, so it's very big. Imagine part of your ancestor trees till the time of Cleopatra, you know, something like this. And you concentrate on this edge, and then you have one side and the other. And then they conjecture that this could be expressed from the Milner fiber of one side here and the Milner fiber of the other side. But now you see it means that it is as if you cut along this edge, you get here a splice diagram with a preferred leaf. That's why I put an arrow here. It means that there you distinguish a knot. And here there should exist an operation which they described the four-dimensional splicing plus a Milner fiber of the same thing on the right. And what is this four-dimensional splicing? Sorry, I have to adjust with the screen. A very strange period where we do things, we are looked by real people, by virtual people, we are filmed. We have to look on a screen how we are filmed. We have to act given that, the reactions from real and virtual people. I wonder if the psychiatrist won't have many new clients because of this period. <clears throat> Okay, so what's this four-dimensional splicing? I will do a symbolic sketch because it's difficult to draw a four-dimensional manifold, but I will comment. One has two um, four-dimensional manifolds, which are the Milner fibers on both sides. So I represent one like this, and one like this. So I put here something of this kind, just to indicate that you have topology inside. And here the same. Now you have a special knot in the boundary here, and a special knot in the other boundary here. The boundaries here are the links of the two singularities. So you have to imagine that this here, the interior, represents the four-dimensional manifold, and this is a three-dimensional manifold, and here the same. If you look only at the boundaries, this and this, you know that the new boundary is obtained by splicing them, which means that you remove a tubular neighborhood here, here, here,
And then what remains, which is this complement here, has to be glued by identifying in a precise way the boundaries here with the boundaries here. In the complex situation, those are two tori. So this, let's do the drawing at the level of the boundaries first. I, that's why, you see, I, I chose to uh, extend one in the horizontal way and this in the vertical way. And this is important for the next drawing because now you can do this like this. You take this part here and this part here and this part and this part. And now you see that this came from the blue side, this came from uh, the violet one. So you find them a priori like this. But now comes the problem, what happens with the interiors? What do you do? And the step is that you extend what you did on the boundary. So here we remove the tubular neighborhood of a knot in the boundary. First thing, extend here the knot inside. And here extend this inside. And remove the tubular neighborhood of all of this. And then I will explain you what is precisely this extension inside. But first, it means that you remove all of this, and here you remove all of this. So now you come with exactly all this part, where you cut, in fact, the four-dimensional manifold along such a surface, and here it's the same. So you get things like this. So you see that you get something like this, but it's still not a four-dimensional manifold because you have a hole here. But now if you think about what is happening here, here you remove the tubular neighborhood of a surface. Because it's a surface with boundary, which is connected, you get there as boundary a circle bundle, which is orientable, but it's a general fact that a circle bundle over a connected surface with non-empty boundary is trivializable. And then it means that you get a trivialization there, and this is a product of this surface cross S1. And moreover, this surface has only one boundary component, which is the initial knot. And here's the same. So you see that what you get here is one surface cross S1 and there's the other surface cross S1. They, those are surfaces with gen genus and in general are, are completely non-equal those genera. So you have to think about different surfaces. But if you understood this structure of the boundary, you see that what you can put here, which is God-given, is a Cartesian product of those surfaces. And then you have this structure of Cartesian product. And their conjecture is that this is the four-dimensional splicing operation. Index four, if you want to say that it is in dimension four. And the conjecture is this precise description of the Miller fiber of a splice type singularities, starting from more simple ones. Okay, are there questions on this? Yeah. I, I didn't understand how you get the surfaces in the first place. Because I did not explain. Okay. So you follow very well. So how do you get? Now we have to remember, we have a special knot in that integral homology sphere, which corresponds here to those arrows. And uh, those special knots corresponding to leaves of splice diagrams have a very special property. They are fibered. 
it means that they are bindings of open books. So you have their special surfaces, which are the pages, inside the boundary. And now such a page, you can push it inside the surface by keeping the boundary fixed. And this is such a surface. What you get there is well-defined up to isotopy. This is the way they described this. So what's this surface? Is a page of the open book on the boundary of gamma, I put left here, for the left diagram with the yellow part here, with binding what? The boundary of that arrow. Of this arrow. And up to isotopy, this open book is well defined. And uh, then you take this page, comma, I did not finish, pushed by an isotopy fixed on the boundary inside the Milner fiber. But now I tell you a second viewpoint which is crucial for our proof of this conjecture. So I say here theorem, and uh, according to all the status, I should put this because we did not put on archive all the steps of the proof. We are still working hard to make things understandable and to fill the details. But theorem done with uh, my collaborators, Maria Angelica Cueto, Dimitri Stepanov, and myself. Is that the Milner fiber conjecture is true. And as a corollary, the Cassan invariant conjecture is also true for splice type singularities. But this had already been proved in 2007 by Andras and Okuma by a completely different method, which means not following that strategy. Because one has complete intersections, there is a formula by Laufer showing that the signature of the Milner fiber can be expressed in terms of topological invariance of the link and the geometric genus of the singularity, which you learned that it's an analytic invariant. And the geometric genus is something which uh, is defined only starting from a resolution. So it does not depend on the Milner fiber. So they changed the strategy in a strategy of work with resolutions of such singularity. And this is how they proved the conjecture after this transform. But I. I found this uh, conjecture fascinating because I said this is a, a place of entrance in the structure of Milner fibers. And I saw it as a kind of beginning of chemistry of Milner fibers. When you, we begin to know how they are uh, built as molecules from more elementary pieces. And that's this uh, passion I, I could communicate to my collaborators and that's how we could work over the years and still are working hard to make things understandable for this. And for me to make things understandable depends very much on the capacity of explaining it to other people. And that's why I thank very much Anne and Javier for allowing me to clarify my ideas, explaining them to you. In fact, I cannot understand things like this. People say that the criterion of understanding is to be accepted by unknown referees in prestigious journals. 
for me, the only criterion is to be able to explain from somebody who is sufficiently far from my domain. I don't say like Hilbert to my baker, because I know that he would not like to listen to me. Mass does, does not interest him, and I want to be tyrannic. I want to oblige him to listen to maths, but... <laughs> no, I have good relations with him, so I didn't even try. <laughs> well, so coming back here, what we hope is that, that what we did, the techniques we developed, could be useful more general to explore other classes and begin understanding how Milner fibers are built from other Milner fibers. And what I wanted to say now uh, here is that what is crucial for our proof is a first reinterpretation of this internal surface. And you will see that's a very uh, easy to understand. I told you that that knot there is obtained by cutting with a hyperplane. Leaves correspond to variables, so each knot is cut by the intersection with a hyperplane of that variable. Okay? Now, Milner fiber is just a nearby surface to the singular one. Well, you intersect it with the same hyperplane. And you get that surface. So, these surfaces are intersections with the same hyperplane of the surface which you moved, but the nearby one is not singular, it's smooth, and that's those things. And it is in this way that we will recognize this. So, you have to have in mind that the problem will be that to recognize inside a given Milner fiber a cut Milner fiber of a different singularity cut along the intersection with a hyperplane of coordinates. And also a piece like this, which is a Cartesian product. So you see we have three pieces with difference of the splicing in dimension three where you cut and you glue. Here it's not enough, you need a supplementary. So question, how to decompose a Milner fiber in this way? And I already told you that the general strategy which worked was Okay. Hmm. So strategy, pick a smoothing, resolve it, and look how the Milner fiber degenerates to the special fiber. So one can say that this is at least as old as Picard and Poincaré, because when you look at vanishing cycles, you see them by looking how the object degenerates to a singular fiber. Those singular fibers are not obtained by resolutions, but it's the same thing. So one of the basic themes of singularity theory is that in order to understand smooth objects, which are unproblematic, we need to go to regions of conflict and what has, see how we get near the conflict. And this, from this viewpoint, the word catastrophe theory is not so bad. Because we cannot keep in peace if we want to understand the world. And we see the actual situation, its good aspect is that it obliges people to think. So not everybody, but I think there will be very good understanding of parts of the difficulties of the biology coming from this the present conflict. And in singularity theory, the same. On Milner fiber, we get structures by looking at the generation. Question? But yeah, Patrick. Uh, your strategy, I'm not clear to me. You say pick a smoothing and resolve it, but it's smooth. So what, what do you mean by so, resolve it? 
What is a smoothing of a singularity? Very good question. This is a singularity. A smoothing of it means that you look at it as a special fiber. So it will be the fiber over a point of a family over the disk. Say this is the center of the disk of a germ of one dimension bigger whose generic fibers are smooth. And this is, again, something where we use the fact that we have an isolated complete intersection. There, Turin approved that there is a universal deformation whose base is irreducible. And you know that a versal deformation gives you all possible smoothings by base change. In particular, it contains all the possible Milner fibers of all the smoothings. But here, we wanted, you see, to make it degenerate in a special way such that the special fiber after resolution has a structure of this kind. We will have a side which looks like uh, the right side, a side which looks like the left side, and some piece there which is a Cartesian product. So we have to choose carefully the smoothing. A big problem here is to choose the smoothing. So finally, how did we choose it? We looked at equations of the form. You start from your initial system, F1 to Fn minus 2. And simply, we add powers of a new variable. T to some power uh, P1 to T to some power Pn minus 2. But here one has to be very careful in the choice of this to adapt them to all the numbers in the splice diagram. And this defines a germ. Why? In a space of one bigger dimension, you added the variable t. So this is inside c to n plus 1. And here you have the projection on the axis of the new variable, c of t. And that's how you get the induced projection here on c. And this will be the smoothing. And then comes the problem, how to modify this? And we want not only to modify it, but to look inside the structure of the exceptional divisor. So you see here, in general, many variants of singularity start by saying, take a resolution. And at the end, you get something invariant. Here it's the opposite. We need to pick a very careful re resolution and describe very carefully the, the structure of the exceptional divisor and to see such a decomposition. So how to pick a resolution? And how to, to modify this? So it means that now we want to start from this. I will, perturb, I, I will complete the diagram here. So I remove this sentence. Like this, I have a little more space here. I also remove this. And now I will complete a little the diagram. Remember that here we look at the special fiber. You see how we constructed the system. It means that we put t equals 0. We get back the initial singularity. So we have indeed a smoothing. And now what is great about this is that it's enough to construct a modification of this y by taking an ambient toric map. So here it will be, we get a toric variety determined by a fan. Which fan? So the problem is to describe very carefully such a fan from the splice diagram. So for people who don't know toric geometry, I say that a fan here is simply a collection of cones. So for instance, if you are in dimension two, you have as fan this first quadrant, this bidimensional cone and its faces, and this is an encoding of the plane C2. 
And now if you have to look here at the integral point, if you look at the point of coordinate 1, 1, and you cut this cone into these two cones, this describes the blow up of the origin in C2. And on the combinatorics of what happens here, one can read the combinatorics of strata which you have there. So if you do a drawing, C2 is drawn like this, so you see that you have the complement of the axis. My drawing has to be interpreted as complex. So you do not have four quadrants. The complement is connected. There is one piece. Then on each axis, the complement of the origin, two more pieces, and the origin. So you see that you have four objects. Those four objects correspond here, this two-dimensional cone to the origin, the edges to the axis without the origin, and the complement here, which is C star cross C star, which is called an algebraic torus, corresponds to the vertex here. And you see that the adjacencies are respected. And this is a game when you have fans, you have cones of varying dimensions which are adjacent. And if you look at the adjacencies, they describe exactly the incidence relations between strata. And this is called toric geometry. It began to be developed as a sub-branch of algebraic geometry uh, around 1970. And the first, say, textbook, research book on this topic was published by Mumford and collaborators in 72 or 73. Now, but the idea, and for example, the name Fan, comes from Michel de Mazur, from around 1970. But if you go then afterwards, when you know that this exists and you look in the literature, you find the elements of this even in the 18th century when people made monomial changes of coordinates. Because you have to know that a sign of the fact that you could need toric geometry is that you discover that for understanding what you do, you need to make monomial changes of variable. And if you see this, you say, ah, perhaps it's a good idea to speak with a colleague knowing toric job. So, <coughs> I say this because in books in general, you don't see teaching of symptoms. You have books with big theories, but how somebody outside that field can recognize that he needs to speak with a specialist of that field? And it would, could, it would be good to have appendices with symptoms for other people. To have a sign that they need to speak with a specialist of that domain. So now, let's come back. Here we are able to describe precisely a fan. This fan describes a, mono, a, modific a modification of this space. Exactly like here we had the blow up of C2. And now we take simply the strict transform here. And now you, we look at the Milner fibers in this composition here. And we look how they degenerate on the total special fiber here. And here the total special fiber is made of the strict transform of X and the compact part, the exceptional divisor, which I call here boundary index zero, above zero, of this object, Y tilde. So, we need to control everything so carefully that we can look in the internal structure of this object. But this object, in order to describe the Milner fiber, is not enough. We don't need to look only at the special fiber, but also at the way it is embedded in the ambient manifold. And you know that for curves in smooth surfaces, you need intersection number. In higher dimensions, this is not enough. Because there, if you say, in the simplest case of a smooth compact manifold in another smooth manifold, you need the circle bundle over it. That's, in fact, classified topologically by its first chern class, so it's an element of a cohomology group. So you could say, well, let's decorate the dual complex of that object by elements of cohomology groups. Blah. And, in fact, that's difficult to manipulate for proving isomorphism. And it turns out that logarithmic geometry brings a, a wonderful tool for dealing with this by uh, 
looking, in fact, at the supplementary structure as a special kind of sheath on the special fiber. So it turns out that one can build not only the Milner fiber, but also the Milner fibration over the circle from the special fiber looked at logarithmically. And I will write this sentence because this is important. One can build a model of the Milner vibration over the circle by uh, using logarithmic geometry. log geometry in the sense of Fontaine Illusi Illusi and Cato. So Cato published the first paper presenting this around 1989 and I discussed with Illusi and he told me that him and Fontaine had some problems of Piadic Hodge theory. They discussed things with Deligne. Deligne sent them a letter which was a manipulation of many line bundles on varieties which are reducible, exactly like the special fibers. And uh, Illusi and Fontaine needed something more general. And in a train taken together towards Oberwolfax, they were working on this and they could write the definition of a logarithmic structure. And then they were excited, and in Oberwolfach they met Kato, they explained this to him. Kato went to Japan, Fontaine began to write a first paper, but then came a first paper on the theory by Kato, with a title, Logarithmic Geometry According to Fontaine and Illusie. And, uh, Illusi was very happy that he did not need to write the initial paper, Fontaine not, <laughs> but uh, that's how things happen. In any case, many people now say it's log geometry in the sense of the three persons. And now I will give you, I will finish giving you the baby example, because I think that to understand why here log geometry can be useful, you have to see something on which you can put your hands on. And the baby example will be exactly like in Ailsa's course, looking at the situation leading to the lowest dimensional den twist, which is in fact, you look at the map from C2 to C, which is, this is say T here, this is X and Y, T is equal to XY. So a fiber here above a point is a hyperbola. I will do the drawing over R, but you will see that already over R you see much of the interesting phenomena. And now this point goes towards the origin, and then you get hyperbolas which degenerate on the union of these two axes. Here. And you can say, well, this Milner fiber can be cut by looking at the part which degenerates on this and the part which degenerates on this. And this is a local analysis, for instance, which is used for describing links of singularities by as plumb the manifold. And there one has always a problem of choosing a tubular neighborhood, which would be here a Milner tube which means that this figure should be computed, should be complete, completed in this way. And then the Milner vibration means that you turn around, you remove here the tubular neighborhood, you choose something there to cut, that something depends on the coordinates. And there are a lot of choices, and at the end you are not very happy when you want to show that two things which depend on many choices are the same. And log geometry gives you a canonical way of cutting. How? Without choosing a tubular neighborhood. 
Riemann said when he described his surfaces by cutting along paths, that the paths should be drawn starting from a boundary point and going to a boundary point. Exactly like the surface is there. And he also explained what happens if one does not have a boundary. Then one has to pick a point in the surface and then pierce there by removing an infinitely small disk. What logarithmic geometry allows is to do that. So finally, since that work of 89, one can do what Riemann said. Just remove infinitely, infinitely small disks or infinitely small tubular neighborhoods. And those are canonical. And let me show you that you already know this. You see? Here the clue is passage to polar coordinates. When you pass to polar coordinates, and I will do the rest of the drawing here, you have here, say, I do a drawing for C. Here the variable is Z. Passing to polar coordinates means that you write Z as is R, E, I, theta. So now you pass to two coordinates, R and theta. Theta is an angular coordinate, it turns on a circle. R is a non-negative number, so it varies on a half line. So here, the two coordinates describe a Cartesian product of a half line and a circle. That is an annulus. It is this. You create it here, a boundary, and the rays which get out of it, when you lift them here, this map is described by this equation, are separated. And you see that in this way, this point was replaced by a circle. It became a boundary. And you see that topologically, it's the same as if you removed a disk around this. So you produce the same effect as removing a disk, but you removed an infinitely small disk, because outside this circle, this map is a homeomorphism. You removed nothing. OK, so people knew this. But here you see that my operation depends on the coordinate. It turns out that one can shifify this operation till it does not depend on the coordinates and you can per perform it intrinsically. Each time you see a Riemann surface and points on it, you can do this canonically. And more generally, each time you have a complex manifold and a subvariety on it, a hypersurface with many components, you can do the same canonically. What you get is not necessarily a manifold with boundary. But it will be a manifold with boundary, which is a model, a canonical model of removing a tubular neighborhood in the toroidal context. Toroidal means that's locally toric. And it turns out that what we do here, this builds a toric variety, so it is toroidal. And now the strict transforms here have a very special property is that they are transversal to the boundary of the toric variety in a very special sense, which comes from the fact that here we have a Newton non-degenerate complete intersection. So the first paper we put on archive was that for splice type singularities, they are Newton non-degenerate, and we described a, comp uh, a fan which allows to get to the toroidal situation when those toroidal those logarithmic ways of removing canonically infinitely small tubular neighborhoods work and gives a correct topology. And uh, I will continue tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Maybe time for one quick question, so that we can start in five minutes. Question. So, uh, I, so you spoke about uh, this hyperbola and this A1 map, and then you said it's related to the oriented blow-up of the origin, but I, I did not get the relation ah, sorry, between yes. the oriented blow-up and the A1 map. I was just thinking that I will begin tomorrow with this. So I will begin tomorrow with this, but let me write it here. So do simply the chain passage to polar coordinates in all three variables. So if you write 
say t is equal to uh, rt ei theta t and x is rx ei theta theta x and y is equal to ry ei theta y you make these changes of coordinates here and you look at what happens and you will see that what happens on the real situation at this level is exactly as cutting the plane along these two lines and also the target above a point. And so what you get here is after cutting this which projects to this. And now a nearby point here lifts to this and you see that when it degenerates to the origin, it degenerates to this part here. But you see that topologically, it's the same. So this becomes a locally trivial vibration everywhere. Here not, because you had a special fiber, which is singular, change of topology. After this passage to polar coordinates, locally trivial vibration. And where do you get the canonical representative of the Milner vibration? Is above the boundary here. So you have to concentrate your view on this, this, and the pre-image of this, which is all of this. And you see here one Milner fiber is here, and because of the corners, it is, in fact, decomposed into pieces. So one can be unhappy to have something which is not smooth. But then we should be happy because the corner locus tells you where you have to cut. Imagine that when you need to cut something, if the paper is already prepared, you come with your knife and <laughs> it's exactly like this. Okay, thanks a lot. So I think that we don't have more time for questions. So let's thank uh, Patrick again.